All right. Well, welcome everyone to uh, making a plan for a clean energy home. This is a, a cool Davis webinar and workshop. And uh, well, before we get started, let's let's do a little bit of land acknowledgement to recognize the land on which we are. Although not everyone is in um, is in Davis right now. I know we have some owners who may not be in Davis, but let's let's acknowledge the land on which on which Covell Commons sits. So I'm going to read the. Um, I guess I'll just read it. Um, we should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, the Kachil Dehi, Dehi Band of Wintun Indians of the Kalusa Indian Community, Klatsil Dehi Wintun Nation, and the Yocha Dehi Wintun Nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through the generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. So I'll start by just saying a little bit about who Cool Davis is. That's who's putting this on. Um, cool Davis is a, a nonprofit organization, community or community-based organization here located here in Davis, but serving the whole region. Uh, it's a nonprofit that serves the community. Uh, the mission statement is envisioning a climate resilient region where everyone has equitable access to resources for sustainable, healthy lives. And you can kind of see some work in the community in these photos. Uh, one of our the biggest things that we do, the, to the way we live out that mission statement is engaging with households to take action, not just talking about stuff, but really figuring out where we need to be engaging with people to help them to actually take action? Is that education? Is that motivation? Is that um, community to kind of share stories? A um, lot of different ways to really engage with households to make sure that we take action. And I am on the board of directors of Cool Davis. Um, and I um, I live at Colvell Commons. See down at the bottom, some of the things that are in the scope of Cool Davis we don't just deal with energy, that's the part that I'm the most interested in, but we deal with consumption, which includes things like water, waste, and plant-based eating, things like that, as well as transportation, um, bicycle things, uh, carpooling, roads, parking, you know, the whole, the whole range of things. Again, all of this is engaging with households to make sure that they take actions so that they can um, they can move towards a more sustainable living. And I'm gonna hopefully this will work. Uh, there's a little video that uh, that Cool Davis has prepared that talk about um, why we want to cultivate sustainable living. So I'm gonna try this. Let me know if you can't hear it. So let's ask some of our community members why it's important to get off natural gas. Our community has been setting goals for itself for decades related to its energy use. So we really have to accelerate our movement toward an all electric economy. Yes, moving off of natural gas is absolutely critical for the city of Davis to meet its carbon neutrality targets in 2040. For our climate action goals and uh, personal quality of life, I think it's both important at the household and local level. And reduction in danger to citizens from moving away from natural gas. Um, and fossil fuels get used up over time and pollute our atmosphere. Fossil fuels kind of suck for the environment and we have the ability to use electricity instead. Much less noisy communities by moving to electric vehicles. Solving the significant problem of climate change and preserving the earth for our future generations. We need to be moving towards a sustainable future. And I want my baby to know that and to um, and to be part of that solution. Everything that we can do as Cool Davis to provide people with information, get us all off natural gas eventually, be able to do our part for our region, for our state, for our country, for this planet. All right. So that gives a little bit of an overview of, um, from a lot of different perspectives about why 
we want to move towards a, a cleaner, more sustainable future. And the focus here, of course, is on clean energy homes. And so this slide talks a little bit about what is a clean energy home. And there's a lot of different things that you can do that lead towards um, clean energy. And there, it's kind of this roadmap shows there's kind of a stacking order in, in which you do things. Things don't always happen in this order, but they have to be done. Um, some of these things uh, are ideally done before others. So it involves energy efficiency uh, choices, uh, behaviors. It, a lot of it is has to do with HVAC. We're going to talk a lot about HVAC today. And if you can you know, deal with some of the other choices and behaviors, you can downsize your HVAC. Also choosing electric. We'll talk about that a lot. And then once you've done all that, making sure that the, the energy that you're getting is coming from renewable sources, either installing uh, rooftop solar or uh, up, upgrading with Valley Clean Energy, um, opting up, I think that's what it's called, to um, ultra green, which we're very lucky in our community to have Valley Clean Energy so that we know if we've opted up to ultra green, all of our uh, electricity use is coming from renewable sources. So even if we can't put solar on our own roofs, we know we're using uh, from renewable sources. So the kinds of things that we're gonna be talking about today are the, uh, I'll talk a little bit about water heating and HVAC, heating, ventilating, air conditioning systems, uh, sizing and making sure they come from electric sources. And then of course, talking about the panel implications because I think we're all finding that once we make the choice to make these changes, we have to look at our panels. Um, a lot of folks here are thinking about changing their panels for safety reasons, and you really need to be thinking about some of these other choices so you don't you know, get down further down the road and kind of wish you'd made a different choice uh, on your panel. So those are the kind of things we'll be talking about. So if you wanna make your home a little bit more of a clean energy home, where do you start? You know, a, a great place to start is getting an audit. Uh, can be done by an HVAC contractor or home performance contractor. A lot of the contractors in our community and some of the folks on the line today um, have committed to providing a free energy audit to anyone that's participated in this webinar. So we'll make sure you get hooked up with that. But in any case, um, a lot of contractors are willing to do these kind of energy audits. There's also a link, which you probably can't get to there, but I, Department of Energy has a do-it-yourself energy audit. And there's a lot of other kinds of sources for ways that you can look through your house and find what kinds of things can be improved. There's a lot of great information on the pg &E's website about things that you can do, um, checklists and, and things to find out where your energy is going. And one of the, thing, one of the great things, if you're an energy geek like me, I don't know how many of you are, but uh, pg &E has great resources to help you understand your usage. Um, you can log in and you can look at charts like this. You can see when when your energy use, when your energy is used, you know, what's the temperature been, what, you know, you can look by month, you can look by hour, by week, you can look, you get a lot of detail uh, just by looking on their website. Now also, down, if you look down in the lower corner, you'll see a, um, a green button. And that's a um, something I think nationwide um, that anyone has the right to get to download the data on their energy use. So you're able to download whatever dates you want, whatever, um, I think down to 15 minute frequency. So um, that's a great resource that we have. And here's an, an example of looking at that kind of data. Uh, one of my predecessors at, at Cool Davis, Chrissy Backman, uh, this is an example of her looking at her data. She was she was looking at the consumption and she noticed, wow, weekends are really different than the rest of the than the rest of the week. And she really didn't know why. And then when she learned about smart meters and got a lot of more information, she was able to diagnose what it was. And I actually I have I found exactly the same thing. You know, my usage on Sundays was way higher and I couldn't figure out why. Turns out it's my dryer. Dryers really use a lot of power. So since I learned that, I started um uh, line drying at least some of my clothes, not all of my clothes. I'm I'm not out there with my apron and clothes pins and stuff, but um, as much as possible, line drying some of my some of my uh, laundry. This is where she kind of found that. You can also 
look at your meter. You, know, you can see from your meter how much you're using. Also, Cool Davis offers, and I think you can still get them at the library. You can check out a watt meter. So if you're wondering about what some of your um, what some of your appliances use, it's it's real easy. You just plug it into the wall. You plug your appliance into it, and you can see how much it's using. My son actually checked this out with his Xbox and found out it used a huge amount of a huge amount of power. So he kind of made some changes after after doing that. So there's lots of different ways to get information about your energy use. And uh, we, I think we all find that one of the biggest energy users, even though the dryer uses a lot of power over the course of a month, it doesn't use as much usually as the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. So that's what we're gonna be spending a lot of time on today. Um, all, you know, all homes in Davis have some kind of HVAC system. And one of the primary things that pe that people talk about, you know, when you talk about HVAC nowadays, everyone starts talking about electrifying and heat pumps. And so I thought it was worth spending a little bit of time on what exactly is a heat pump. It's, you know, it, you know, it's just not a term a lot of people are familiar with. So I wanted to talk about, you know, what exactly is a heat pump and how does it work? And the best way I find to explain it is it's it's a pump. Think of it as a pump. That's not just a name. It is actually a pump. It pumps heat. And just like water, you think about the laws of physics, water always flows from someplace high to someplace low. You are never going to see water just flowing up a waterfall, right? It's just always, it's a law of nature. It wants to go down. And if you want it to go up, like up into a water tower or something like that, you have to pump it up. It takes some energy to pump it up there, but it, you know it's not going to do it on its own. And similarly, heat, heat always goes from someplace hot someplace cold. You will never see heat going, you know, the opposite direction. So if you want it to move in the opposite direction, you have to pump it. And so I, well, let's just go through an example. You see at the top here, it's in the summer, it's, you know, crazy hot outside. It's nice and cool inside. So which way does the heat want to go? The heat wants to go from the outside to the inside, right? That it's always goes from someplace hot to someplace cold. So if you want it to go the other direction, you have to pump it. Similarly, in the winter, if it's cold outside and nice and warm inside, the heat's gonna wanna go from inside to outside, but you're gonna have to pump it to get it to go the other direction. And the reason that's nice is that um, it turns out it takes a lot less energy to pump heat than it is to create it. Now, creating heat is, just imagine your toaster, you know, you plug it in, the resistance of the wires makes them glow and get hot. So you're actually, you know, creating the heat um, with that. And it can only be 100% efficient. But it turns out that with a heat pump, if all you're doing is pumping the heat, you're not creating it, you can actually get three times the energy out that you put in. So a heat pump is three times as energy efficient as, a, um, as any other kind of, of heating. And so through the miracle of physics, heat pumps are 300% efficient. I know you thought nothing could be more than 100% efficient, but it's actually 300% efficient when you look at it a certain way. So heat pumps are a, a great, a great invention, a great, um, a great new appliance on the, on the horizon. And here's a little hint. You probably already have a heat pump in your house. If you've got an air conditioning system that looks something like this, you, you, you might have, you know, air conditioner unit outside, a furnace that's burning natural gas inside. And when it's operating as an air conditioner, the heat, you know, from the inside is like going up through the ducts. It goes through the air handling unit and then it kind of goes to the outside. You know, the air is not moving out that way, but so you're pumping the heat outside. So your air conditioner that you're used to is a heat pump. So you already have a heat pump. And if you have a certain kind of air conditioner, you, there's a valve that makes it run backwards. So then you're pumping the heat from the outside to the inside. And then that's uh, that's a heating system. So heat pumps are nothing new. You know, it's exactly the same as an air conditioner, just running backwards. And so there are systems designed to be able to go back and forth. That's a heat pump. Some things to know about heat pumps. Um, like any system, bigger isn't necessarily better. So you want to make sure that the contractor does a load calculation and makes it just the right size. Uh, they they provide more air, so the air is less warm. So if you're used to you know a blast of nice nice 
cozy air. It's not like that. It it um it it's running a lot of you know a longer and it, you're not going to get a blast of warm air. And in fact, it has to defrost sometimes. If it's cold enough outside, it's going to have to run backwards for a few minutes to so that the coils outside don't freeze up. So it's basically running like an air conditioner. So you'll get a little blast of cold air, but that doesn't last very long. Um, and your contractor can, by making sure your supply registers are placed just right, you can avoid some of those drafts. But that's something you do need to be aware of and don't be surprised when you see it. Don't call your contractor and say it's broken. That's the way it's supposed to work. But on the whole, it, do, it will definitely do a great job of keeping your home warm. Heat pumps can have something called strip heaters in them. And that, you know, think about the toaster again. Just imagine you have a toaster sitting in your duct. That's what a strip heater is. So it's an electric resistance, very inefficient way of providing heat. And um, most times in Davis, you really don't need a strip heater. You should talk with your contractor about whether you want to install one. But if you are putting one in, you make sure that you need to make sure it's well sized and it doesn't run when it's not needed. And one of the real reasons to not do it is that it has big implications for the panel, because the uh, um, again the the heat the toaster uses three times as much electricity, so it's a huge amount of electricity that it's needed. So if you can avoid that, um, uh, you'll have much better luck on your on your panel. There's also something called dual fuel systems where there's a natural gas backup. Um, the the goal of that is that the gas is only a backup. It's not you shouldn't have to use it very often, if at all. So it might not be worth it to have it as a backup because you're you know that's a whole lot of stuff you got in there just to provide a backup. But those kind of systems are available. Um, I'm gonna have to zip through some of these things. Um, I'm not gonna focus too much on this, but there's a lot of different parts of the HVAC system that you uh, really should pay attention to. There's ducts. You know, if you don't, if ducts are leaking, ducts can leak 30, 40%, you know, you spend all this effort heating and cooling air and then it just gets leaked out and you don't even get to benefit from it. So that's a huge problem. So it's really important to make sure that the ducts aren't leaking, they're well insulated, they're not all crimped so that the air can't get through, that affects the efficiency. The air, air handling units, which is the thing that blows the air within your house. Um, they're single speed, multi-speed and variable speed systems. Uh, they vary a lot in terms of efficiency. They can vary in cost. Uh, for variable speed, the controls can somewhat can be somewhat complicated to configure. So make sure your contractor sets it up to to work really well for that. And then finally, filters. Uh, I think we all kind of know we're supposed to change our filters pretty frequently, but that is really really important to to make sure that the the ducts aren't getting constricted with uh, with a clogged filter. And particularly when there's these smoke times. Um, if you get a, a filter that has a MERV 13, that's a number that's that's on the filter, then that will uh, that will filter out some of the um, some of the uh, factors in smoke that make the uh, that make the air less uh, less healthy. So it's a good idea. MERV 13 tends to be real restrictive, so it, it increases your energy use. But what you might do is just put the, those MERV 13 filters in when it's smoky and put regular filters in when it's not. That's what I do. Um, load shifting is an important thing to keep in mind. The cost to produce electricity changes a lot throughout the day. You know, when, so, when there's a lot of solar coming in, it could be pretty cheap. When, um, when everybody is running you know, in, on hot afternoons when everyone's running their air conditioner, they're getting home from work and they've got their air conditioners running, the system can be really, really constrained. And then they end up having to put online some of their dirtier uh, generation resources. So it's usually good to try to keep your load as flat as possible. It helps to really reduce your costs because the uh, electricity is more expensive, generally from 4 to 9 p.m. And something kind of related to that, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this here in Davis, is the um, free night cooling with the Delta breezes. We're so lucky, even if it's crazy hot during the day, it always cools off, almost, almost always cools off a lot in Davis. So if you can just bring as much air as possible through your house at night when it's nice and cool, and then close things up real tight in the morning, um, I find that I can 
quite often get through the whole day without ever turning my air conditioner on. So we're really lucky. Not everybody has, um, you know, weather conditions like that. And there's a video on our YouTube website, um, our YouTube site, uh, Live Cool Davis, that explains exactly how to do that. And a lot of that has to do with your thermostat settings also. You wanna, another thing you can do is pre-cool your house so that you're cooling it when the, when it's not the peak period. And then when it is the peak period, you can just start letting it float and you might end up not, not using any electricity at all or not using any air conditioning at all during the peak period. And again, there's a video on that. Um, I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but there's also the whole concept of envelope, which is the, you know, the outer shell of, of the home. It's got walls, it's got a roof, it's got a ceiling, it's got windows, it's got floors. All those things need to be nice and tight. If you're, again, if you're just wasting a lot, if all the air is just blowing all through your, through your attic, through your, through, you know, gaps in your windows, you're just wasting a lot of, a lot of electricity. So really the first thing you should do is make sure that those kind of things are, are dealt with. Make sure you seal, uh, particularly sealing between the, you know, between the rooms and the attic, because the attic gets really hot in the summer. And if there's, if there's, uh, leaks between the attic and your home, you know, you're getting this, you know, 110, 120 degree air coming right in your home, which obviously isn't efficient. So that's something to look at. And the last thing I want to talk about is water heating. Um, we, we talked a bit about heat pumps to, to warm up your, your home. They can also be used to heat water. So that's um, another electric end use that you're going to think about there's two different kinds. There's kind of a normal one, and then there's a hybrid heat pump water heater that includes electric resistance heating. You know, think about the toaster again. It's you know, you don't have a toaster in your water heater, but it's that same idea that you've got these heating, very very inefficient heating elements that are heating up your water just in case you you're lacking the capacity. And so, if you have a hybrid water heater, um, it might increase your bills if you're if it's relying on it very often. It dramatically increases the power requirements. You usually need 200, uh, 240 volts, you know, a lot of amps to provide all that heating. Um, and often you can, you can avoid that uh, in particular by upsizing the tank a little bit. If you have a nice big tank that has, you know, a lot of hot water in it, if, if it's a really cold night, then when, when you're not getting a lot of capacity, you might be able to slide through it if you have a big enough tank. So something to talk with your contractor about. Another thing to keep in mind is that the heat pump water heater gives off cold air like any heat pump. It's basically, remember, it's like an air conditioner running backwards. So it's like pumping cold air out the back end. But if that's in a closet, if you're, I know mine here at Cobell Commons is in a closet. And if you, if it's not well ventilated, it's going to get really cold in that closet. And the efficiency really drops off if the system is trying to reject heat into a really cold, um, into a really cold or gather heat from a really cold closet. So you want to make sure that it's really well well ventilated, sometimes ducted you know, with a fan or sometimes just having uh, nice big louvers are enough. And then finally, you need to think about the power requirements. This is um, heat pump water heaters are one of the biggest challenges to electrification because it's kind of a new load that you're adding. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So electrification. What exactly is electrification? Um, essentially, electrification means replacing fossil fuel appliances with electric appliances. Pretty straightforward. Uh, fossil fuels, a lot of reasons for doing that. Uh, fossil fuels obviously are, are a big contributor to climate change. Once you burn natural gas, there's no way to kind of undo that. Uh, there's um, So you know, if you wanna avoid burning fossil fuels, the only way to do that really is by going electric. Uh, electricity can be produced with natural gas or coal or whatever. And so, you know, that's not the greatest, but it can be produced without burning fossil fuels with, you know, rooftop solar or opting up to ultra green. So it's really important where the power comes from. But if you, if you don't use electric, you will not ever be able to avoid natural gas. So if you want to avoid fossil fuels, you have to electrify. And that's really, um, the city of Davis has real strong goals and California, 
and the world really has a lot of goals for getting away from fossil fuels. So the only way to do that is by electrification. Uh, electricity can also be much more efficient. I just talked about, you know, three times as efficient compared to uh, furnaces and water heating. And another really, really important reason is to remove combustion from your home. You know, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. You know, we're basically burning little bonfires in our houses. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the systems are, you know, control things pretty well, but there's always a concern about carbon monoxide uh, from your uh, from your furnace, from your water heater, from your natural gas stove. You know, all these things give off carbon monoxide, and there's a potential, you know, great potential for for health problems from car from um, from the combustion of natural gas, and so you know. Electrification just completely removes that combustion. You know, it's happening at a power plant. If it is burning natural gas, it's happening at a power plant where they can control that um, that emission. So it's not uh, it's not uh, impacting um, health as much. And one nice thing that to something I hadn't even really thought about is that when I had some other work done on my house and they the they were going to require me to put in a carbon monoxide sensor, and I said, wait a minute, I don't have any combustion appliances so i don't need a carbon monoxide sensor every other home needs a you know a, a needs a carbon monoxide alarm but if you don't have any combustion appliances you don't need one inside i still have a water heater but that's outside so that you know there, there's really big impacts of on health so how do you electrify um the you know, the whole title of this this webinar is making a plan to so you're not going to just go and do it all at one time that's that would be a huge project you'd have to really be saving up a lot of money for it so it, it's a really good idea to start start small you plan your your process and what it's going to uh, consist of is replacing your hvac replacing your furnace with a heat pump replacing your gas water heater with a heat pump water heater replacing your cooktop if you have a natural gas cooktop, replacing it with an induction unit, which is as responsive as gas. I'm not a real foodie, but I know a lot of other people, you know, a lot of cooks would never consider using a, a electric cooking. But then they found that using an induction cooktop is just as controllable as natural gas. And they, a lot of people really like it. I, I have an electric resistance cooktop in my house. So, you know, I'm, I'm all electric there, but... Um, you know, and it doesn't, you know, I boil water, so it really doesn't matter. But anyone that's really in interested in cooking probably will want an induction cooktop. Dryer, you know, needs to be electric. Um, there's uh, heat pump dryers that are available. And then finally, your car, you know, it's not really an appliance, but if you're burning gasoline, you know, that's the same as burning other kinds of fossil fuels. So if you can go to an electric car and have an EV charger, um, that's electrification. So you need to be planning for this when you're replacing electric panel. So I think it's important to keep in mind that your next appliance replacement will probably be electric. You know, a lot of people are like, hmm, do I really want to go electric, you know, natural gas? You know, a lot of policies are moving in the direction where it's going to be harder and harder to get and harder and harder to be allowed to install natural gas appliances in homes. In California and elsewhere, there's you know internationally, of course, uh, there's federal tax incentives that are going to make it much, you know, much harder to put in a natural gas uh, system. State building code is moving towards all electric, and then local ordinances. You know, Davis and Yolo County's climate action adaptation plans are you know pointing are showing the roadmap for how we're going to get to all electric homes. Uh, I know there have been some ordinances in other cities, like I think Portland and Berkeley, where they were you know, not allowing putting in natural gas, and those have been in the courts. I don't know where they're at lately, but I think the writing is on the wall that you know a few years down the road, you are going to be putting in electric. So you need to be thinking about that now as you're making other kinds of other kinds of choices. Um, yeah. So, if if you do electrify, you're going to have to think about your panel, and a lot of people are already thinking about their panels for heat, for safety reasons. You know, replacing uh, hazardous Zinsco panels 
which have been shown to, you know, to be uh, more likely to result in fires and electrical problems. So a lot of people are replacing their Zinsco panels. So when you do that, you should be thinking about these kind of electrifications. And so what, you know, what is electrical service and what is a panel? I'm going to talk about that a little bit. There's a picture of the back of my house. <laughs> um, the, you can see there's a PG&E box there where there's a, I assume, a, some kind of a transformer. Um, but that's where the service is coming in. And then there's a, a wire that runs to my, basically to my house. And that service, um, many homes have 75, 100 watt, 125 uh, excuse me, amp service. That's how much current it can serve. Uh, if you need to get a higher service, more amps, that could be a very expensive undertaking. It may require trenching, you know, digging, you know, to run a new wire, some kind of transformer upgrades, support from PG&E. Um, that is definitely doable, but that really adds to the cost. So if there's any way to avoid having to do that, um, it's, it's, it's good to try to find ways to do that. There may many homes may find that they're going to have to do that and that ends up with a, a lot of delays it can take a really long time and again very costly but um it's good to start thinking about this now because you don't want to make one change and then find out later on you're gonna have to make another change so bite the bullet and do it now um and that from that service then it feeds the main panel this is the main panel you can see my heat pump down there and the panel is just above it and so that's where all the power comes into my house. And then it feeds the air conditioner there. And then there's another circuit that's going into my house. And then you see in my house there above my dryer there, I've got my electrical panel. That's a sub panel. And that has circuits for all the different end uses. And this is one where you can see this is a Zinsco panel. So I'm going to have to replace that Zinsco panel. Um, but so I'll, I'll talk in a minute about uh, sort of how, how to figure out what, what kind of size you need for these things. But your, uh, your HVAC contractor, uh, your electrical contractor should be able to help you a lot. And you need to let them know, I'm planning for this in the future. Maybe I'm not doing it now, but I want you to know I'm gonna be adding this stuff later. So make sure that I'm gonna have the capacity for what I'm gonna be adding later. Um, so to, to figure out how much of a panel you need, this shows the city of Davis. They have a worksheet where you kind of, and again, your electrician will fill all this out for you. You don't have to do this, but this kind of shows what how, the, how they approach it. You add up all your different uh, end uses. That NPR is the nameplate rating. Uh, it's basically, you know, it's a nameplate on the unit, or you can look at the how big the breaker is and, and do a little bit of math. But you add up all this stuff, and then it, at the end, it tells you whether or not you can fit it all in the with the service that you have. I have a hundred amp service, so you'd have to add that up and make sure it's less than a hundred. If that doesn't work, there is also an alternative way of doing it, which is to look at your uh, PG&E energy use and to show the most that my home has ever used is this many watts. And so ba basing it on that, rather than just adding up all these name plates, looking at how much has it used in the past. So I, I don't actually know the details on how that works, but your electrician should be able to, to, to look at that. So if the first weight method doesn't quite work, doesn't get you, um, the, you know, the level of service that you're, you're going to need, then that, that is an option. So we'll want to look at that. So I'm going to show a few scenarios here. For um, this is for my house. What I, you know, as I've been making a plan all along and installing some things, and this is what my panel has been looking like. This is basically the City of Davis worksheet version. I, you know, kind of written that a little bit, but it shows the numbers that I have um, on the general loads. You kind of add all these things up. The first 10,000 watts, you, um, it counts. And then everything above that, they only count 40% of it. So they kind of decrease it a little bit because they know that not everything is going to be running all at the same time. So they decrease it. And then the, the HVAC and electric vehicle side, you just add all that up, add these two numbers together, get the total watts divided by 240. It tells you how many amps. So that, that was my home a couple of years ago. This is what I have. So you see the, the range is a huge, that was the hugest one. Uh, the clothes dryer, 
you know, is the second largest. So those are two huge end uses. And, you know, I don't, they don't use that much energy over the course of the year, but when they're running, they use a lot. And that's what the panel is based on. So I had 89 amps. So that's well within my 100 amp service. So a couple of years ago, um, I installed a heat pump. So I wanted to see, hey, can I install a heat pump? It turns out that a heat pump, like I said, it's basically an air conditioner backwards. So since I already had an air conditioner, it didn't really impact my panel size very much. I, I can do a heat pump with pretty close to the same um, wattage or amperage as a um, as the air conditioner. So it didn't impact things. So yeah, I was fine when I installed my heat pump. Then about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, I installed the EV charger. So we looked at my at this again. We added, I think it was about 5,700 um, watts. And then you add up all the numbers, and it's 113 amps. So no, I didn't have enough. I didn't have enough room on my panel, so I could not install an EV charger. So we had to figure out something else to do. What we ended up doing is installing a switch, so that I can only run my dryer or my EV charger. I can't run them at the same time. They're you know whenever my whenever my dryer runs, my my EV charger can't get any juice. So it never goes over, you know, on the panel, it looks just like the dryer, you know, the EV charger doesn't even show up on the panel because they're sort of sharing the same circuit. Um, and so I was able to do that well, again, within my my total amperage. So I had no problem installing the EV charger so long as I used that switch. So now today I'm considering uh, putting in a heat pump water heater. And so I, I'm looking now at, um, whether I have enough for this. And a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, when I put it in the heat pump, it did not have a strip heater. If I forgot to mention that earlier, if I had chosen to put in a strip heater, I would have needed to upgrade my panel because that would just be too many amps and it would not have been allowed. So similarly with the heat pump water heater, if I put in one of those hybrid ones, they use really a, a lot and it would not have fit within a hundred amps. So fortunately, there are some great heat pump water heaters that are 120 volt. Um, you know, if they don't, if they're not hybrid, they don't have the the uh, electric resistance heater. Um, they're you know much lower power, and so it looks like I am going to be able to do it without making any upgrades to my panel. I'm still going to have to replace the Zinsco, but I'll just replace it with a non-Zinsco panel of the same, pretty much the same size. So we don't know for sure, but this is kind of what we're working with, and and we're gonna check with the city to make sure that make sure that this is all gonna work. But it's looking like that's how it's gonna work. So um, when to make clean home upgrades? Um, you know, we talked about making a plan, but anytime you're remodeling, it's a great time to start thinking about oh, should I? You know, let me if I'm remodeling my kitchen, let me do something with my cooktop if I'm, you know, remodeling anything else, you know, and they, these are actually, these are, they look really vintage, but these are brand new appliances. That's an induction cooktop and it's an energy star refrigerator. So, you know, you can make some really nice aesthetic choices and still uh, think about uh, clean homes. Uh, if you're concerned about air quality, comfort, if your bills are high, those are all kind of good, uh, good times to start thinking about making changes. Is your system kind of on, on its bat last legs? Is it something that's gonna be failing pretty soon? Um, you can stay ahead of that uh, by starting to plan to make a change. So if you do uh, decide to make a change, you're gonna find that you're embarking on a home energy journey. I think any kind of home improvement, I'm sure you've, <laughs> if you've had experience with home improvements, you know, you start out, curious, excited, you get overwhelmed, you have doubt, you get relief when you find out that it's actually going to maybe work, you're kind of content with your choice, then you're unsure because you hear about more options, you're happy, you're satisfied, you're frustrated. It's a roller coaster, just like any other kinds of home improvements. But I think most people, you know, when they get through the end of this, this project, you know, they'll end up happy that they've made the change. So one thing I, I really want to encourage people is to have find other people that are going through the same journey and you know share your thoughts and 
you know, encourage each other and keep yourselves moving and um, uh, really, you know, moving the projects forward. So making a plan is particularly important for HVAC. One of the things that you find is, you know, I know we have some HVAC contractors here. You know, a lot of times HVAC systems fail on the first really hot day of the year or the first really cold day of the year. And that's the day that you're going to call a contractor and say, oh, my God, my system is dead. Please come and give me a new system. And they'll say, I'll add you to the list. But, you know, we've got a lot of people that are asking for that are asking for service now. So um, really, that day is not the day you want to be making these changes. You want to be making it uh, um, well ahead of time. And um, if you do, and if you do get them to come out, you're going to need something right away. Right can't really do without heating you know when it's the middle of, you know when it's the beginning of a really cold snap so you're going to get whatever's on the truck so all this great planning that you're doing is going out the window so it, it's really important to to work, deal with this ahead of that day so if you have a plan you can evaluate your options get multiple bids figure out financing options um, do other kinds of energy efficiency improvements before you know fix those windows and stuff so uh, seal your attic so you can get your system as small as possible and hopefully phase it, uh, phase the installation over time. One thing you're gonna wanna consider is how old is your system? If you've got a system, if you don't know, a lot of people don't really know, they moved into a house and it is what it is. And Cool Davis can provide you with a, a home energy report that will tell you how old your system is. You know, when was the last time a permit was pulled on it? And that'll help you make a, a decision, you know, talk with your contractor. How long do you think it's going to be before the system, you know, maybe doesn't operate effectively or as efficiently and start making a plan to, to change it. So working with contractors, uh, Cool Davis has a lot of great resources on the website to you know, worksheets and things like that with, to give you a lot of uh, pointers on how to work with contractors. But you know, the usual kinds of advice, shop around, make sure that you've got good communication with your contractor. The really important thing is not all contractors, you know, they're not mind readers. So if you don't tell them I'm really interested in high efficiency, you might not get the high efficiency choice. Or if you don't tell them I really want electric, they might not necessarily offer that as the first choice. So let them know that you want you know, the, these better systems and don't be afraid if they, if they do come and they tell you, you know, hey, I can, you know, give you the really ultra efficient system, it's gonna cost more. Most, a lot of people are like, oh, that contractor, he's trying to sell me something. But if you can um, really you know, communicate well and understand what the options are, uh, you'll end up with the right, with the right system. Um, so, and one thing I really wanna emphasize is contacting a contractor early. Even if you're not planning to make a change right now, it's good to have a relationship with contractors so that they can let you know when they have a really good deal, when there's some, um, when there's you know rebates and tax credits that are coming out, um, you know, so you, you can be ready, you know, when when the opportune time comes along. Also, if you have a maintenance contract with a contractor, that will allow you to get priority service. So if you call them on that really hot day, you're going to be at the first of the line, at the front of the line, uh, to get service. So it's a good idea to make a relationship with your contractor. And then of course, the first question everyone always asks is how am I gonna pay for this? And I think the first thing to say is to think about the life cycle cost, not the initial cost. These things can be kind of pricey, but if you look over the life of that system and how much less it's gonna cost you, um, you'll, you, know, you can make a choice that will work best for you in the long run. Um, Contract, it's hard, really hard to stay on top of all the different rebates and tax credits, but your contractors should be able to help you with that because they, they're in the business, they know, uh, they know these things. Some contractors offer financing to help. There's other sources of financing, look in particular with uh, credit unions and energy efficiency programs. And we also have some information on the Cool Davis website on, on financing and how to, um, how to pay for the system. So to kind of wrap things up, um, start making your plans now. So start looking at where and when you use energy, get kind of familiar with what your situation is. Start talking to a contractor so that you'll know what the options are and you'll be able to they'll, they'll help alert you when the time might be right and 
can be ready to move when you know when there's stuff available and the prices are as low as possible. Talk with your friends and your neighbors and uh, get ideas, get you know, help support each other. Um, start saving up now. You know, I used to be people would buy things on layaway. You know, they would pay it off, pay it off, pay it off before they even received it. And nowadays we usually, you know, buy things and then pay for them, pay, pay back for them. But if you know that this is coming down the pike, you know, you could start saving. That's, you know, that's obviously going to start, uh, going to lower your costs in the long run. And then finally, uh, start with baby steps if you need to, you know, just do some behavioral things. Look at your thermostat, um, you know, make some, you know, make some easy choices, you know, to get started, kind of build up some momentum. And um, uh, so make baby steps if you need to, but start today and start thinking about what can I do today to get myself on this path, I think. Yeah, so you're not gonna be able to click on these links, but if you go to um, cooldavis.org, there's a um, cool solutions page that's got lots of resources, all this stuff that you see here. Uh, and also take a look at the at the YouTube channel that we have, it's got a lot of really great information. So, you know, Cool Davis is here to help you with these uh, as you're embarking on on these kinds of projects. Um, that's That's our job, so. Thank you very much. Um, I know we have some local contractors here and a, a lot of others within the community. Uh, I know several of them have offered to provide a free energy audit because you participated in this workshop. So ask you to take the post take the post survey. I think we have a pre and a post survey. Uh, Chris can let us know what the links are for those. Um, that'll help you to to get access to those free audits. But I think we have a little bit of time for some questions. And then uh, the plan is that at about 3.30, I'm gonna have my door open. So um, I you can come by and see my heat pump, see my EV charger, see the switch that I installed, see my Zinsco panel, you know, from a distance, don't touch it. <laughs> danger, danger. Um, so, you know, you can see my natural gas water heater that I'm probably going to be replacing, but you can kind of see, you know, I've talked a little bit about my journey and you can kind of see what it all really looks like and kind of share thoughts with each other. And we'll have some experts there to help answer some questions. But I think if we have questions now, we have a few minutes now, we can have um, some questions and then stop by my house, 2137 Bella Casa. Yeah, Kristen, do you want to just introduce um, all of our experts that are here with us today? Yeah. Yeah, great, thanks. And it occurred to me, I don't think I introduced myself at the beginning, maybe. Um, I'm Kristen Heinemeyer. I'm on the board of directors of Cool Davis. I work at Frontier Energy. I've been working on energy stuff for going on 40 years now, so I'm an energy person. Um, and I just see Danny's face now, so I'm gonna introduce Danny. Is your name Danny Fox? I thought it was. Yep, uh, okay. Danny Fox Alverson, yes. Okay, that's it, right. Uh, and he is with Griner, so welcome. And uh, he is going to be uh, coming by my house in a bit uh, to help answer some questions. They were the ones that installed my heat pump, so he can answer some questions about that. I see Alex Sloan from Electrify My Home. He's also a, a great, we're lucky in the community to have him uh, and, and that company. to. Uh, they do a lot of electrification work, uh, heat pump installation, uh, panels, things like that. Um, Bill Dakin is uh, formerly uh, with Frontier Energy, the, my company. He is also a, a volunteer with with Cool Davis. He's on our Home Energy Task Force, the chair of the Home Energy Task Force. And I think I see, I think I see his wife sitting in the background there. Julie, hey Julie. <laughs> uh, is anyone else I'm missing? Of course, Chris Granger, executive director of, of Cool Davis. And Brendan Rueda is uh, on the staff, Cool Davis. You know what I'm missing? And our, we have a few of our um, Sacramento Valley College Corps members who are going to be on site today, but they also joined us um, for this. Uh, um, they just help help with staffing our um, in-person events and making sure that everything's uh, set up and you get materials and all of those things handed to you when we see you. So thanks for being on site today. 
All right, so we have, I don't know if there were any questions that were submitted. Chris, if you could. I'm not seeing any right now. Um, I, I, I know that you started our conversation with everyone as they were coming into the um, room with us, um, you uh, to the Zoom room with us, you were talking a little bit about their different situations. I'm wondering if um, anyone after listening to Kristen and what she's been thinking about doing with her home in Coval Commons, any of that has made you uh, think about uh, your particular situation and um, if you have any particular questions that you think um, you'd like to hear from our various experts on. And you can go ahead and unmute and just, and, um, and uh, you know, um, also um, turn on your video if you'd like. Just raise your hand. Let's see. Um, so we still have uh, Dan. I think a few of our um, participants have already uh, exited. Um, Dan and Jim, or I'm not sure how to uh, pronounce your name, Yushao. Um, did any of you have any questions? This is Jim. I have a quick question about EV charger. And uh, I wonder in, in our communion, uh, Korea Commons, does the EV charger mean installed outside the, away from the unit or how, do, how will it be installed in the future when I put in for that? Yeah, are you, um, if you're able to come by, uh to my house you'll be able to see my charger i have an ev charger right in front of my house and there's a you know i, I can plug my car in i'm lucky my carport butts right up to my front door so i was able to, to run the cable there um if my parking spot was further away that would not have been an option because you have to worry about tripping and things like that so i was lucky that it's just right there in front um so you know it definitely can be done but it you know not all um you know, not all households or layout is, is going to work for that. I know, Dan, I don't know if you have anything that you want to say about, I know Cobell Commons was thinking about installing some common chargers that, that uh, different people can use. I don't know if that's moving forward. I know Dan is, is the, on the board of the Homeowner Association. I know has been looking into that. I don't know if he's able to unmute, but um it's something we can ask the homeowner association about because that that's a great option too. Um, you know, you obviously don't need, leave your car chart you know plugged in all the time, and you know it, a community like this could probably get a great use out of a, a couple of community chargers. So yeah, it's definitely a possibility. I don't and. I don't know if you're in town here, but definitely swing to my house to hear any charger. Okay, thank you for the information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, um, Kristen, I know you're going to need to. Uh, um, run here soon. Um, any of our experts, um, we're, this is a really interesting, uh, rather rapidly changing environment we're in um, with more and more people asking to um, install um, electric appliances and electric heat pump appliances. I'm, I'm curious as to um, uh, what you're seeing um, in terms of you know, the number of people that are opt making these decisions right now with, with their homes and, um, and what kind of outcomes you're seeing for people is, uh, um, uh, I think a, there's historically been a lot of questions about whether we could do this and you hear all kinds of things in the, you know, out kind of generally in the news about, you know, worries about electrification, but I'm, I'm curious about your experience and, 
and um, how happy your customers are right now. Yeah, I can uh, tell you for Griner. So a couple years ago, you know, we were maybe doing about 10% of our installations as heat pumps. Uh, this last year is up to about 70%. So at about 400 um, heat pump installations, and that was taking out, you know, existing gas units and changing them to heat pumps. So uh, it has become the norm. Um, if it, it's, it's the more common thing for people to do. Um, it's gotten to the point where economically it just makes sense, where in the past, um, one of the biggest worries we ran into was it was going to cost more to heat with electricity than it was for gas. But with PG&E's rapid increase of gas prices um, and also the rapid increase of efficiency in heat pumps, it's actually gone the other way now, where it's actually uh, less expensive to heat your home with a heat pump like just dollars and cents wise. And so when people are replacing their systems, uh, just with a you know, few basic math calculations, we can show people that, hey, this is actually gonna save you money uh, and help to pay for this installation that a lot of times you have to do anyway because the system's old and needs to be replaced. Um, so yeah, the adoption has been huge. Um, customers for the most part are happy. I mean, it's really important. I think things like this are good because you do need to know the differences, you know, the like the defrost Kristen was talking about. You need to know those things. Uh, there are things that we do to help with that, not only talk about in the beginning, but try to put in like a small bank of heat strips like Kirsten was talking about uh, just to help with defrost. So there's things, uh, talk to talk to your contractor, talk to us if you're talking to Griner, and just, you know, make sure you know everything that's going to happen when you get that new heat pump. But they are a great option and they heat homes very, very well. Thanks, Danny. Anybody else want to comment, uh, Alex? Um, yeah, sure. So it, it, it's interesting. Our um, customer segment's a bit different since we're a pretty specialized company. So we do 100% heat pumps and only electrification. The only thing we do with gas is put caps on the gas lines. And so the, the questions and comments we get from our prospective customers are slightly different since a lot of folks are already bought in to a certain extent. But I will say that there's just ever-growing interest in going all electric and um, starting to, to put the right steps in place to uh, get there in advance, right? So Kristen talked about coming up with a plan. That's really the most important thing, especially with electrification. When it, go, when, we, when it comes down to just replacing an existing HVAC system with the same type of system, well, it's pretty simple. We can just take one out and put one, a new one in. But if we want to go about electrifying the whole house, there's some really strategic decisions to make. And so we're getting more people coming in the door, uh, starting, you know, requesting to make those initial steps, which is great. And it's really important because you don't need to do everything all at once. You can take things at your own pace. Um, so yeah, the, the, what I'll mention about the outcomes of our customers, it, it's pretty, uh, pretty much the same across the board. Everyone comes out with a much more evenly uh, tempered house. So when you set up a right-sized heat pump that's running longer cycles at very low amounts of energy, your house almost gets uh, the radiant effect. So if you've ever heard of someone with radiant floors, for example, they like how their house is all the same temperature, um, we can achieve that with a, with a regular ducted mini split system. And so uh, customer satisfaction is always great. I will say the only times we usually get calls is when a customer forgot that initial consultation advice uh, that Danny was referring to. It's really important. Heat pumps work differently than a gas furnace. And so if you try to, uh, you know, turn it off and then turn it on in the morning and it's 30 degrees outside and your house is 50 degrees inside, it's going to take a long time to heat up. So that's the one thing that folks sometimes forget. So we recommend always keeping the setback on your thermostat um, as close as possible. And that's going to um, continue to make these much more comfortable. I know in, um, when uh, Kristen was uh, talking about her situation, she was showing how she kind of moved through that decision-making process and, you know, adding each new appliance along the way. And her, her big one now is looking, at, um, is looking at a heat pump hot water system. And sometimes that last thing is the thing that can keep you from, um, you know, makes you look at whether or not you need a, a new panel. Um, and I know that Kristen is, 
thinking about whether she might need a new smart panel, which is a new device, which allows you to do more energy management. And I was hoping that maybe the two of you uh, might be able to, and um, Dan, Bill, um, might be able to uh, give us uh, some thoughts on um, those new devices that are arriving and how to kind of do energy management, not just with our existing appliances, but also in some homes now we have solar, we have battery backup systems, and the smart devices are allowing us to do really interesting energy management. So could you speak to that? Um, I'd be happy to. Maybe Bill will give you the crack um, since we've talked already. <laughs> sure. Um, well, there are several options. Um, one is to what, talk about what Kristen did, which is using a switched breaker, which you can do to, if you've got loads that aren't going to, um, occur at the same time, um, like like the, the chance of using the dryer at, at the same time you're charging your electric vehicle is very unlikely in most situations. So that's a really good strategy and low cost. There are also some um, smart panels available and more and more becoming available. Um, I'm aware of the SPAN panel, which is S-P-A-N, um, which is a controllable, it, auto, it switches between loads um, automatically. So, um, um, but there are other manufacturers that are making that kind of devices. I'm not really aware of those, but there's lots of options that are available to keep it under a hundred, keep it at a hundred amps um, and, and satisfied loads. Also the, another yeah. option, if you don't have, um, this is becoming more popular. If you have an electric dryer, you can also switch to a heat pump dryer. Um, I've had, I know several people who have done that recently and are happy with them. Um, so that's one way to reduce your load. So on your dryer circuit. Yeah, I'll, I'll just comment, uh, you know, the span is a great technology. Um, I think it's best place is those circumstances where you are limited by capacity. Of course, um, you, you know, it's going to cost a whole lot to trench or to upgrade to 200 amps. Um, but in the case where you want to have full service from everything in your house, right? You want the biggest, fastest dryer. Um, you know, your heat pump is maybe of a certain size. You want fast recovery on your water heater and you want two of EV chargers. The span is going to be the best way to do that. But, you know, if your lifestyle is a little bit more flexible and you're okay with, you know, not drying your clothes and heating your water at the same time, the circuit splitting devices are fantastic. Um, there's also circuit pausing devices, which act in a similar way. Um, but instead of just sharing a circuit between two 240 volt appliances, instead it's, it, it's just got metered um, uh, current transformers. And when your panel is about to exceed um, its 80% of capacity, it'll just turn that unit off. So that's another way to go about it as well, is a circuit pauser. Um, but we have a lot of options nowadays. We've got heat pump dryers. We've got um, 120 volt heat pump water heaters. There's a uh, Sanco 2 water heaters that only have a 15 amp circuit. So um, I think we need to continue talking about the alternatives and the more affordable options first, and then fall back on those smart panel options, which are to my knowledge, the most common are the span, of course, and then, you know, there's a Leviton smart panel, which is kind of a dumb panel with smart breakers that um, are controllable. Thanks, Alex. I ask a question about uh, the span panel. I understand that if you're going to go with solar, I mean, it seems strange to me, but solar uses up the amount of amperage on your panel. It seems like it should subtract, but it actually adds to. And also, if you're going to ever install a battery, um, what I understand is the span panel can be a great solution for that. You can like really optimize when you're charging, when you're discharging the battery. It can be a real home energy management system. Is that something that is starting to get some traction? Yeah, it can be used for that. Uh, many of those systems, your solar system, your battery system already has a lot of that stuff built into it. Um, so you would just need to make sure you're optimizing everything to work properly together. I, I think the, the span panel was designed to make, you know, smarter choices in your home to, to allow you to really 
uh, be able to use your energy correctly and efficiently throughout the day. And really where we've seen it the most uh, valuable is really just the cost savings of we, we had a client that it was going to be, you know, $30,000 to just do a 24 foot cable from PG&E and instead doing a span panel, reduce that cost to down, down to about 10% of what it was supposed to be. So that's, that's really where it comes in, but it is really nice. Uh, I'm having one installed in my home and I do have batteries and I do have solar and I do have a way that I control all of that already, but I'm excited to see uh, it all working together in the span panel myself. So, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, Kristen, I know you you're going to have to go soon. I don't know yep. if you can think of any other. It's great to have uh, you know a little panel of experts to uh, yeah. talk about these uh, great new tools we have, um, and for our homeowners to to see kind of that they really do have some options. Um, you know, this this whole thing with the Zinsco panels in particular has been a nice little surprise to have um, or not so much um, for our homeowners and to, um, to, so having some ideas about options for the future and uh, ways to think about this problem right now um, are, um, it's been really helpful to have you all join us today. Yeah, thank you very much. And once again, anyone who's in the neighborhood, I'm at 2137 Bella Casa. I don't know if we're going to have this in the recording. Let me take a recording. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely swing by and you can see all my cool toys. And I, I think Danny's going to be able to be here, uh, kind of explain some of the stuff that I've, that I've got. I can certainly explain it too. So come on by. And our other staff will be on site. They'll have copies of our materials. Um, uh, so we'll send you those links afterwards as well. Um, and, um, yeah, we are, we hope you can join us. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.